imagine you wake up in the middle of the night one night with a pain in your chest. At first you're thinking, maybe that curry wasn't such a good idea after all. But the pain doesn't go away, and eventually you become concerned. Concerned enough that you decide to call an ambulance and get to the hospital. And you get to the hospital, and you're not there very long when you go into cardiac arrest. Now, if you've watched as much TV as I have, you're probably expecting the scene to look something like this. Medical professionals surrounding you, doing chest compressions, making sure you're getting oxygen. This is all part of what's called basic life support, a standard set of training that all medical professionals go through. If things really take a turn for the worse, you might be expecting to see something like this, a guy coming at you with the paddles to shock your heart back into a normal rhythm or restart it. This is part of what's called advanced cardiac life support, and again, is something all medical professionals get trained on. What you're probably not expecting to see is something like this, where they're cracking open the textbooks over your bed, looking up what they should do next, while somebody in the corner takes out their phone and Googles resuscitation techniques. <laughs> And of course, that's not what you'll see. Medical professionals are highly trained, and it'll be more like the first two pictures. But this might not be too far from what could happen than you might think. In 2008, a study was published that followed a cohort of nurses. Now, they'd all been trained in basic life support and advanced cardiac life support. They'd passed their certification, and they were moving on from that. But what the study did was follow the nurses for the next 12 months and periodically retest them to see how much they'd retained. And what they found was with basic life support, after only three months, the percentage of nurses that could still pass the certification had dropped to 63%. And over the course of a full year, it dropped a little bit more to 58%. The situation with advanced cardiac life support was considerably worse. After three months, it had dropped to only 30%. Only three in 10 nurses could pass the certification requirements around advanced cardiac life support. And by the end of a year, it had dropped to 14%. Barely more than one in 10 could still pass the certification. And the recertification period for this material is two years. So, when I see this data, three things pop into my head, and I'm sure it's the exact same three things that are popping into your head right now, because I think it's the same three things any reasonable person would think when exposed to this data. The first is, I hope I never wake up with anything more severe than indigestion. The second is, do I really need to know how to do this stuff for myself? Because I'm going to need to watch a lot more Grey's Anatomy if I do. Those guys seem to really know what they're doing. But third, People are not really surprised at the notion that we forget things that we learn pretty quickly, but they're usually very surprised at how much we forget and how quickly it actually happens. And here we're dealing with trained professionals that are highly motivated, working in a very high stakes environment that they take very seriously. So it's the best possible circumstance in many ways. But it turns out it's not their fault. It's actually got very little to do with how motivated you are, very little to do with how smart you are, and even very little to do with the educational material itself. It's much more to do with three million years of evolution and how the brain works and how misunderstood we've been in our ways of teaching people things and expecting a better result than this. Now, it turns out we've actually known this for quite a long time. 130 years ago, a German philosopher and scientist called Hermann Ebbinghaus conducted one of the first scientific studies into long-term retention. And what he found in having people memorize patterns of gibberish and then testing them over time was what now is called the forgetting curve. And it's a slope of a curve that shows just how quickly people forget things. And much like the nurse's study, it's far faster than most people think. It turns out that as little as 30 days after you've learned something, 79% of it is gone. So you're only remembering 20% of it. And in fact, most of the loss happens in the hours and days right after the learning event finishes. So if we've known all of this, why have we not done something different about it? Why do we continue to teach things in the same way and expect a different result? Well, part of the answer might be that although we understood empirically that this was happening, we didn't understand why. We didn't understand the neurophysiological processes that were going on. And in the last 20 years, that started to change, largely as a result of the development of a technique called functional magnetic resonance imaging. 
Now, a traditional MRI is designed to image tissue in the body, such as the brain, so that you can identify things like a tumor. It's a static picture. fMRI is designed to allow you to see in real time what's going on in the brain. And it does this by looking at blood flows and the change in oxygenation levels in your blood. And it turns out this is extremely valuable in researching cognition because there's a very strong correlation between blood flow and oxygen levels and neuronal activity. So we've been able to start to identify and uncover distinct neuro neurophysiological processes that are going on in the brain. Now, my colleague and a professor at Harvard Medical School, Price Kerfoot, decided over a decade ago that he was going to devote his research to trying to develop a new way to teach people things that took advantage of all we've learned from neuroscience and psychology of how the brain works and for the first time build a system that actually works in tandem with the brain rather than actively working against it. And what he's done now in over 20 peer-reviewed randomized controlled trials is develop, test, and validate just such a methodology. And it's based on two fundamental principles. The first one is a principle called the spacing effect. And what the spacing effect says is that if we repeat the same information for you over regular spaced intervals of time, that will generate long-term retention of that material. And it turns out that you'll remember it not just as it's getting repeated, but beyond even when we're done with the learning intervention. And we've actually started to identify, in this case, neurophysiological processes and a protein in the brain that's involved in this process. So we can see what's going on. The testing effect says basically that if we ask you a question, rather than just give you the information, you will remember it better as well. And that's also been validated. Think of the question as acting like a memory hook. So what he did was develop a methodology that uses this and works in concert with the brain. And essentially how it works is instead of dumping a ton of information on top of people all in one go, we have them learn the material in spaced out intervals of time in small chunks. Essentially, typically for us, three to five minutes a day, and it's all question and answer based. Now, these can be quite sophisticated questions that draw on multiple skills and knowledge areas for you to answer correctly, and then you're presented with the explanation of why the correct answer was correct, and that's all spaced out over time. And he's been able to show some dramatic results with this approach. In one study, the control group learned the same material, but using a standard web-based teaching module. And you can see in the graph that initially there's very fast uptake of the material, the red dot spiking showing those knowledge levels climbing. But almost as soon as the learning intervention is over, immediately retention starts to fall off fairly dramatically. And notice when people were tracked over the course of almost a year, by the end of that year, they were back to baseline. They were back to exactly where they started. This was a complete waste of their time. Using the methodology that he developed that he called spaced education, a very different result. Notice that it takes a little bit longer for people to acquire the knowledge up front as it's spaced out over time, but there's little to no retention loss over that same year of the same material. And it turned out this methodology was perfect for a device that didn't exist 10 years ago when the research first started, but is what we use every day now as part of our implementation. And it's the device you're all carrying with you today, a smartphone. So what the methodology allows you to do is learn in three to five minutes a day by responding to these questions. We've implemented the methodology in software in an adaptive way that actually adapts to how people respond. So as people demonstrate mastery in one area, we don't bother them with it anymore. As they're struggling, we show them that material more often. And the spacing intervals are handled automatically. All anybody has to do is when their phone buzzes on a given day, take three minutes at some point during that day to respond to the questions and read the material. And not only has Price been able to show extensions to retention, but he's also been able to translate that into behavior change and beyond. So in one study that he conducted with urologists, urologists were learning a new set of guidelines for when to perform a particular test for prostate cancer called a PSA test. The test is somewhat controversial because it has a high rate of false positives. So a lot of people get told they have cancer when they actually don't. So a new set of guidelines had come out about when to screen and when not to screen. And the control group learned that material in a typical electronic e-learning form. And the other group used the spaced education methodology. 
Now, at the end of that trial, what we saw were higher retention rates with the group that had used based education, which we've seen before. But what was different in this trial was that we were able to track the physicians for two years afterwards and their prescribing practices. And with the group that had learned the material using the spaced education methodology, there was one third fewer unnecessary cancer screenings than with the control group. Now, that's a cost saving for a healthcare institution, and in these days of skyrocketing healthcare costs, that's nothing to be sneezed at. But the real benefit was a lot of people did not get incorrectly told they had cancer when they didn't. And in one of his most recent studies, the, he's actually been able to take it beyond behavior change directly to patient outcomes. This study was done with primary care physicians, and it was about how to treat patients with hypertension, high blood pressure. The goal is to get patients to a target blood pressure as fast as possible. And again here, what tends to happen is physicians tend not to be as aggressive as they should be initially in treating the hypertension. So it was a set of guidelines designed to help them be a little bit more aggressive in the initial treatment with the goal of reducing time to target blood pressure. And some of the physicians learned the material using this methodology, and there was a control group that got it in a more typical e-learning fashion. And again, they were tracked, and in this case, their patients were tracked for a year after the study finished, the learning finished. And what they found was a measurable, statistically significant difference in faster time to blood pressure for the patients of the physicians that had learned the material this way. And other research has shown us that there are lower risks of stroke, cardiac event, and death associated with faster time to target blood pressure. So at the end of the day here, what we have is an interdisciplinary approach that's taken some of the latest neuroscience and psychology, implemented that in software, taken advantage of a ubiquitous device that everybody now carries with them, and been able to use that to not just drive better long-term retention or behavior change, but have measurably positive results on people's lives. So with a wider use of a methodology like this, I believe we can have an even bigger positive impact on the lives of people around the world, not just their professional development, but the outcomes of the people they work with every day, whether it's caring for them in the medical profession or beyond in other roles. And what that will allow us to do is be in a situation where if you do wake up in the middle of that night and you have that pain in your chest, maybe you're a little bit less nervous about what happens next. We can all be a little bit healthier, a little bit happier, and get back to watching more Grey's Anatomy. Thank you.